You will not be on screen. Is that what you're making? Sure? Well, you I was worried that I might. Will you click on that alert and yeah. click on side yeah. for me? Yeah. And then there can be one more for me. Can I just move my slide with you? Something to just. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Family. Yeah. Do you know who is joining us over Zoom? I think my friends Christina, Robina, Olavi are joining through Zoom. And if they are not, you guys can look at it. Or, or did you say your parents are going to be on it, maybe? So they are having intern, they are in a different district right now. So they're having internet connection problems. Mm -hmm. So if they can join, they will join. But I think my sister is joining. In case she's not joining, then I don't know. Mitty's here soon. Yes. <laughs> what about two minutes? Okay, we'll two minutes then. Okay. <laughs> so, so you might not need it. Yes. Yeah. We do have a cup of water, or do you need a cup of water? Or Water? I just had it. Okay. So I have it up a little. Okay. Okay. Is this a good? I know. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Okay. And perfect. I have flowers and everything. And it's not hard. We will be having samosa. I'm sorry, it got a bit cold now. So <laughs> it, it's it's still delicious. It's really <laughs> Even more. I'll let you finish your soup because I'm okay. Feel good? Yeah. Okay, so we're one minute past 10 o'clock, so we'll begin. Um, thank you all for coming to support Subi in our MS defense. Um, this is Sujo Pedetal. Um, we call her Subi. Um, and just a little bit of information. Um, she was born in the Lumbini region of Nepal, um, got her bachelor's degree in biotechnology from Provincial University in Nepal. Um, and then after that, I um, spent some time um, at the Isha Hatha School of Yoga, um, becoming a yoga teacher certified. Um, and then after that experience, um, joined us here um, in integrative biology at OSU um, for graduate studies. Um, so it's been an enormous pleasure. Um, to have you around, Subi. Um, she's one of our many through the pandemic students. Um, and it's just a massive accomplishment to thrive in this space. So um, I'm not going to say much more. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, Dr. Lemmer. And good morning, everyone. And welcome to my master's thesis, Defense. And welcome to those of you who are joining via Zoom as well. I appreciate it. And so without further ado, I'll start my presentation. So the title of my master's thesis, the thesis is Seeking Secret Sequences, a Comparative Population Genetic Analysis of Ficus religiosus chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA. This slide looks tricky. 
So firstly, we'll start with the outline of how things are going to be throughout the presentation. Uh, firstly, we will start with some background information on organelle DNA, and then we will advance into ficus species and Y ficus, and then we will move on to my uh, two research objectives. The first one being examining relative levels of DNA sequence polymorphism in <clears throat> ficus religious cells, chloroplasts, and mitochondrial DNA. And secondly, investigating the patterns of population genetic structure in ficus religious cells, chloroplasts, and mitochondrial DNA. After we look into the objectives, we will explore the methodology section and what we did to get the results that we got from the nucleotide diversity uh, using PI in ficus religious cells, chloroplasts, and mitochondrial DNA. And then from the population genetic analysis using structure and principal coordinate analysis. And finally, we will look into the conclusion aspect and see how my research turned out to be finally. Now moving back to my research. Uh, when we talk about DNA, where exactly is this DNA in a plant cell? So it is relatively well known that the nucleus is where most of the genetic material resides, but it is also important to note that specifically when we talk about the plant cell, we can find genetic materials in other two organelles that are chloroplast and mitochondria. So uh, even though nucleus is huge, we are not going to talk about it because that is not the focus of my research. We will rather focus on the chloroplast and mitochondria because it is highly significant to my research. So moving further into the chloroplast and mitochondrial genomes. So they are often used to study plant evolution, specifically talking about the chloroplast DNA. It has been a bigger focus of plant molecular evolution and systemic research owing to a small genome size and its extensive molecular characterization and lower rates of nucleotide substitution in comparison to the nucleus, obviously, nuclear DNA, which kind of provides us a platform to study plant phylogeny. While on the other hand, for the mitochondrial DNA, even though it has a remarkable variation in terms of its size, uh, it is either linear or circular in plant cells, but that also depends on different plant species. And whereas, if we talk about mitochondria in plant animal cell, they usually have higher rates of evolution, but it's not so in the case of plants, because in case of plants, it kind of usually so shows extremely low rates of nucleotide substitution. And this kind of has led for the mitochondrial DNA, often not being the focus of many plant phylogenetic studies. So, while there has been evidence that the rates of sub synonymous substitution rates in mitochondria is typically several times lower than other plastic genes. However, there have been recent discoveries that were done that kind of suggest that there is more variation in this particular plant organelle than we previously thought it to have. And even more so on a recent study that was done across ficus species, by Wang et al. in 2020, it also questioned our previous understanding of the mitochondrial DNA evolution and begged further investigations. So talking more about ficus, uh, this is a very diverse group of plants that contains around 900 species of tree, shrubs, and even vines. So this is uh, mostly commonly known as figs. And it is native primarily to the tropical regions of Southeast Asia and is prominent due to uh, different reasons. And the first and foremost being uh, it is very culturally prominent uh, in terms of uh, its sacredness. And also it has a huge potential to be a model system for studying symbiosis. So being more specific about it and more specific about the findings from the Wong et al. paper, they had observed an incongruence between the chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA and overall organelle DNA coevolution across the ficus species. And, and I just have the chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA because that's relevant to my study. And you can see that on the right-hand side of the 
screen. And looking further into the ficus group of plants, uh, ficus regiosa specifically is of specific interest to us. And that's because of its scientific as well as cultural importance. So uh, the scientific and the medicinal aspects has been studied over the course of time, as well as its antibiotic, anti-diabetic properties of ficus regiosa has been studied. Uh, but why it was relevant to us was because the chloroplast DNA sequence was already available in the NCBI. And after the Wang et al study, the mitochondrial DNA sequence was also made available to us. That kind of created a favorable technical environment uh, that helped me advance with this thesis. Moreover, uh, ficus regiosa also holds a great significance to different communities, specifically talking about communities. It is more prominent in Buddhism because the historic Buddha, Gautama the Buddha, got enlightened while living under this tree around uh, 600, 500 BC. And not only that, it is also sacred to different spiritual traditions, be it Jain, be it uh, Hinduism, and as we can see on the figure on the below, uh, on, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, for this long going down to the Bodhi tree. And on the right-hand side, on the bottom, you can see a uh, Bodhi tree that's worshipped in a local temple in India. And this is a common site uh, in Southeast Asia, for example, in India, in Nepal, uh, wherever there's Bodhi tree, it's usually found in these conditions. And not only that, coming from the West, I can also vouch that it just has more of a culture and spiritual significance as well, apart from uh, being of a religious importance. So uh, let me just peel back into the cultural aspect of the Bodhi trees further. Uh, story time. <laughs> so <laughs> the story is a bit of incomplete without uh, mentioning Ashoka. So Ashoka was a great emperor from India. And uh, this context is important because he was one of the first most, one of the most prominent uh, figures in Buddhism who was responsible for propagating Buddhism around the world. And that in turn led to the propagation of ficus religious as species across the globe as well. So currently there are two prominent lineages of the sacred Bodhi tree. The first one is at the original place where the Buddha got enlightened, that is in Bodh Gaya, India, as you can see on the figure here. And the second one is the Sri Mahabodhi tree that is currently in Sri Lanka. So how this tree came to Sri Lanka is that uh, the King Ashoka's daughter, Sangamita, were, uh, had taken a sapling from the original Bodh Gaya Bodhi tree and planted it in Sri Lanka where it is right now. And we'll talk more about these two lineages in the next slide. So let's just trace back to the timeline of how these things came to be. So tracing the timeline of the trees further, the first sacred Bodhi tree was the original uh, Bodhi tree that Gautama the Buddha sat under in Bodh Gaya in around 600 to 500 BC. As previously discussed, a sapling of the original Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya was brought to Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka by Sangamita, the daughter of Ashoka in 236 BC. So this tree still continues to live today and is widely recognized as a historical tree and is even uh, is in the UNESCO World Heritage site, it's listed there. However, on the other hand side, over the last 25 centuries, the tree in Bodh Gaya has experienced a lot of assaults and periods of neglect due to uh, the prominence of, Buddhist, prominence of Buddhism declining in India over the last two millennia. For example, uh, in around 254 BC, it was rumored that Ashoka's wife, Trishaka, destroyed the original Bodhi tree because she did not favor Ashoka converting into Buddhism. And however, uh, a second tree was grown uh, 
near from the nearby roots of the uh, destroyed tree, replacing the original Atesas uh, Jinwar. <laughs> so despite these and other stories, uh, the tree destruction continued to follow uh, owing to the Muslim invasion in India in around uh, from 13th to 17th centuries, and also then uh, the invasion of British <laughs> in uh, India. So this and many other factor led to an unrecoverable damage to the original Bodhi tree. However, during the 1800s, a uh, British archaeologist, namely Alexander Cunningham, uh, he, in order to renovate this whole uh, temple, he planted a sapling that was nearby the destroyed Bodhi tree and planted the sample, which is now known as the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, India. So that is why this information is relevant to us. And it is important to note that while the, while the Buddhism was being propagated around the world in 1910, a sample from the Sri Mahabodhi lineage was taken to Hawaii. That was, that is in Foster Botanical Garden. And why that is important to us is because we have we were fortunate enough to collect samples from uh, the Foster Botanical Garden as well that has ancestry to the Sri Mahabodhi lineage. And furthermore, uh, it is actually in 2017 when the actual sample collection was initiated by the Denver Lab, and a lot of people have contributed. People who have been a part of the Denver Lab throughout. And we will talk more about the samples soon. But I would like to first introduce my research objectives. So the first research objective of my thesis, excuse me, is to start, sorry, examine the relative levels of DNA sequence polymorphism in the ficus regiosus chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA. Secondly, the second research objective was to investigate the patterns of population genetic structure in the chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA of ficus religiosa. So in order to work towards this direction, uh, the methodology firstly started with sample collection, but that had uh, mostly already been done when I entered the lab. So we started with DNA uh, extraction uh, that had already started for the chloroplast DNA for the 61 samples. And then, PCR for both the chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA, and then running the gels to see how many of our samples actually worked. And then when the bands were bright and visible and wonderful, <laughs> then they underwent the PCR cleanup and DNA sequencing. And then we basically analyze and check for quality control. And uh, we use MEGA for doing that. And that has further led to my two research direction, research object. Okay. So expanding further into uh, the investigation of the nucleotide diversity, I used pi as a measure of uh, diversity to look into the mitochondria and chloroplast DNA. So the type, so the, I'll just sum it up. So the diversity metric was given by a formula which accounted for the proportion of diversity. That is the nucleotides being different at different sites and combination of the DNA samples that were being considered. And secondly, uh, I used two uh, different analyses of which the first was structure, which was uh, which is kind of an open, not kind of, it is, it is an open source uh, program uh, for population analysis that analyzes uh, different uh, distribution of genetic variants among the population uh, using the Bayesian iterative algorithm. And how it does is, is that it places samples into groups whose members are, whose, mem whose members share similar patterns of variation. And here I use that tool to cluster the samples uh, based on the prior provided, for example, we can say k equals to two, but we will talk more about it later. And I will just recap more about the samples. So uh, the samples that were 61 in number were collected from diverse locations 
if I can say so, it was collected from around the world. So here are the blue samples were the samples that were collected from Hawaii, that were 23 in number. And the green samples were the samples that were collected from India that were 15 in number. The red ones were the samples that were collected from Sri Lanka that were 13 in number. Uh, the green ones that are here were the samples that were commercially sourced to us through online seeds, and they were six in number. And the remaining four samples uh, were from four different places. The pink ones were from New Zealand, the turquoise was from Australia, and the purple was from uh, Washington, USA. So moving further along, so here the there are different alphabets. So what these alphabets represent? So here the alphabet, I'll start with B alphabetically. So here the alphabet B represents the samples that had historical confidence in being a descent from the Bodh Gaya Bodhi tree. So if we count, it turns out to be five. And the alphabet S here, not S, S here represents the samples that have historical confidence in being a descent from the Sri Mahabodhi lineage. And the ones that are written as A are the apocryphal stories that uh, have various levels of claims of being a descent from the original Bodhi tree, either from uh, Sri Mahabodhi or from the Bodhkaya sample. So this is how it's labeled. And uh, once the samples were collected, we had to design the PCR low size in order to do the PCR. So uh, firstly, we, how we did this was we targeted the long homo polymer formic nucleotides runs within the reference that was provided to us from uh, the Wang et al. for the mitochondria and from the NCBI for the chloroplast. So once that was provided to us, we targeted the home polymer regions as you can see on the top left, uh, there's a stretch of home polymers that were targeted due to their high mutation rates and also associated expectations of within species natural variation. So once those homopolymer uh, regions were identified, let me just say the homopolymer regions were identified using DNA SP for the chloroplast. Uh, DNA uh, that was already done by Dana and other lab members from the lab prior to my arrival. Whereas for the mitochondrial DNA, I had used a uh, biopython to target these long homo sorry, home polymer stretches that were either to a base pair or longer, except for the one C that was an exception. And in that a total of 16 primer sets were designed and tested using the reference genomic DNA available. Then that was sequenced. And finally, I will recap my objective first. So for my first objective, I examined the relative levels of sequence polymorphism in the chloroplast and the mitochondrial DNA. And how the results turned out to be where there was overall less homopolymer variation in the mitochondrial DNA as compared to the chloroplast DNA. As we can see, the total number of homopolymer variants as well as the SNP variants is larger in chloroplast DNA than in the mitochondrial DNA. And we further used uh, MEGA and DNA-SP uh, to calculate the nucleotide diversity and found out that the chloroplast DNA was faster evolving than the mitochondrial DNA, even to the extent of being 15x times more. So how this was, if, so if you look at the table, we can see that the numbers for the chloroplast DNA are also very low. <laughs> But even though if the chloroplast DNA is though it's still 15 times more faster evolving than the mitochondrial DNA. And we also use DNA SP to calculate the internal diversity. But uh, this is what the pi estimates were using the SNPs only for different models in the PEGA. So secondly, I use structure to look into the patterns of population genetic structure. In chloroplast DNA, firstly, we'll talk about the chloroplast DNA. 
So uh, here in the left-hand side in figure A, uh, we can see the likelihood values of that are increased with an increase in K that's on the x-axis. Here we can see that uh, with up the K, the values keep on increasing up until K equals to four. And that is the where it reaches a peak value. And the likelihood value then starts decreasing more and more once the level of K beyond four is increased. So here in this, uh, in this graph, we can say that the optimal K for, for our analysis was concluded to be four. On the right hand side, if you look at figure B, it shows that the change of maximum likelihood values, delta K with each increasing single increments of cluster uh, size K, the sharp increase in the likelihood uh, estimation from one is to two and three is to four points to a higher likelihood uh, of the chloroplast DNA set of for increasing cluster size up until four. So the dip of delta K value for two to three can be attributed to a large standard error of maximum likelihood estimate for K equals to three on the right hand side, you can see there's an error bar or for K equals to three cluster. And uh, hence the delta K that was calculated with the lower bounds for the MLE estimations. And thus the maximum likelihood plateaus for K equals to greater than four is kind of depicted by the small values of delta K or K greater than four that just keeps on going below that. So we can say that the best conclusion uh, after doing this was that four is the optimal number of ancestral groups that was best supported for by the data set. So diving deeper into these four different clusters, here on the x-axis, uh, we can see 61 samples that were plotted. And on the y-axis, we show the probability of each of these samples belonging to these four clusters. So here the colors in each column represents the probability for each of these individual cluster, sorry, each of these samples belonging to that particular cluster. For example, the green color represents cluster one, the yellow color represents cluster two, the blue color represents cluster three, whereas the red color represents cluster four. And here we can uh, clearly see that cluster one is the biggest one. <laughs> And for the visual simplicity, we uh, thought we, I, I tagged samples from both Gaya and Shima Bodhi as colored arrows with a diamond end. And I tagged the samples with apocryphal stories with red arrows with a circular end. And all the samples that were from an unknown descent were tagged as simple gray arrows, as you can see in this slide. So moving further along, here is, uh, it is interesting to note that all the trees with strong historical evidences of ancestry from either the Bodhgaya Bodhi tree or the Shima Bodhi tree had very high probabilities of until one of membership to cluster one. So that suggested that to potentially suggest a strong genetic signal associated with the historical sacred Bodhi tree lineage. And, uh, no samples that had strong historical ancestry to the either of the two lineages were received in the other three clusters. So the samples that were receiving highest probability for cluster two were mostly derived from uh, commercial sources. Six out of eight samples here were commercially sourced, whereas two other samples were from two diverse different locations, New Zealand and Sri Lanka. Whereas for cluster C, the samples that were receiving the highest probability scores were from mostly from Sri Lanka. That is 12 out of 13 of these samples were from Sri Lanka and there was an, one outlier that is K1 that was supposed to be an apocryphal uh, descent of the tree. And finally, a single sample SL10 was the sole tree with the highest probability for cluster four.
So moving on to the principal coordinate analysis that was done for the chloroplast DNA, I plotted two principal components on the x-axis uh, and y-axis respectively. On the x-axis, there is principal component one that has an explained variance of uh, 0 0.58. And the component two has an explained vari variance of 0 0.28. So here we can clearly see that the clusters uh, that were found by the structure analysis are very well supported by the PCA analysis as well, given that it gave the same four clusters and the mappings were also very uh, similar to that that was shown by the cluster. So the cluster one uh, is in inverted triangle green. The cluster two is in a triangle shape in yellow. I think that's a diamond and structure cluster three. And uh, the fourth one is the SL10, which is a structure cluster four. So uh, we did a similar uh, analysis, obviously for mitochondrial DNA as well, and uh, found out that the optimal number of clusters uh, to be k equals to two for the mitochondrial DNA, as you can see here on the right hand side for figure A. And uh, this was also depicted by a uh, higher maximum likelihood estimate value at k equals to two. And then for figure B, uh, we can see the rate of change for maximum likelihood estimate to be greater than k as shown in figure B. So diving deeper into, cluster, into these two clusters, same as chloroplast DNA uh, on the x-axis, we can see the 61 samples. And on the y-axis, uh, the probability of each of these samples belonging to that particular cluster. So the mitochondrial DNA analysis supported only two major clusters because 60 out of 61 samples uh, had a higher probability score for cluster one. And the sample SL10 was the only one that received higher probability for falling into cluster two. So moving on to the principal component analysis, I use the same method uh, of plotting the two principal components on the X and Y axis respectively. Uh, here, the principal component one explained variance was 0 0.49 and the principal component two explained variance was 0 0.17, totaling to a total of 0 0.68. So here the clusters that were found by PCA were not quite informative as it was for the chloroplast DNA. However, it is still important to note that SL10 is still a cluster, is an outlier even in this cluster. And that was also well supported by the PCA analysis. So concluding uh, <laughs> and coming to summarize my thesis, so my thesis, my thesis revolved around a ficus species that was of great spiritual significance to different cultures, specifically to Buddhism. And we zeroed down on ficus religiosa, where we examined the relative levels of DNA sequence polymorphism in chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA. And we found out that there was overall low levels of nucleotide diversity across both the chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA. However, it was very really interesting and important to know that chloroplast DNA still had a higher genetic diversity as compared to the mitochondrial DNA, which adheres to the patterns that was previously observed in other plant species as well. Secondly, uh, while investigating the published genetic structure in both the chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA for the ficus religiosa, the chloroplast DNA analysis clearly uh, showed four distinct clusters where all the Bodhgaya Bodhi tree and Srima Bodhi tree uh, samples showed near to one probability of membership to the same cluster, that is cluster one, whereas moreover, three out of those four apocryphal stories that had claims to being a uh, descent from either of these lineages also fell into the first cluster. And the other two clusters were mostly comprised of the commercial uh, and Sri Lanka samples, respectively. 
However, there was SL10, which was an outlier that was an outlier even for the mitochondrial DNA analysis, which was slower evolving in comparison to the chloroplast DNA. And just the visual description of SL10, which is the outstanding tree. Uh, so to wrap up the conclusion, this is how the SL10 looked like. It's beautiful. <laughs> and this is the red cluster you can see on the <laughs> Back to my slides. Uh, so as with as with every work, there's a future direction uh, for the work that was built through this thesis. So one thing that can definitely happen for a more elaborative work would be more sampling from more sampling of ficus religiosa from its native range that could allow for better representation of trees from its net native habitat uh, that is in Southeast Asia, ranging from Vietnam to Pakistan. And secondly, we could also, that I did not do in my research, obviously. <laughs> uh, we could do high throughput sequencing, DNA sequencing that could provide a more robust analysis. And maybe I just a not alone if there's more samples. And then, uh, Jazzly is already on it, <laughs> but uh, it also uh, this system could also provide opportunities to look into the diversity of evolutionary and biological phenomena through looking into figuas coevolution, and it could also expand upon the lens of ethnobiology by looking into the cultural uh, human aspects regarding to the tree, and the analysis could also be extended to samples that were collected from other culturally significant species like ficus vanguinis that is known as burr in the native regions of Asia and compared it to our Bodhi tree that is the ficus religiosa. So these are some of the directions that could be taken forward by whoever wants to. <laughs> uh, oh wow, it's ending, okay. <laughs> So the credit where it's due, uh, this thesis is a labor of love and would not have been possible without the love and support of all of the people around me. So I thank everyone, but firstly, I'll start with my committee members. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to my advisor, Dr. D. Denver, <laughs> for the uh, support kindness and guidance he has provided me with uh, for the last three years. And he has believed uh, in me through and throughout and has understood me as I have navigated through life situations and has been a, <laughs> sorry, a great support uh, to pursue what truly matters to me. And uh, I think, one of the biggest legacy of this lab is compassion and competence that I hope to always carry within myself. And uh, uh, no, my amount of thank you will ever be enough, but thank you, Lord Denver. And coming to my committee members, I would also like to express my gratitude towards the graduate committee. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, first, <laughs> Professor Dr. Jamie Cornelius, <laughs> Dr. Jerry Bartholomew, <laughs> and Dr. David Madison, uh, all three of them who have provided me with such constructive feedback from the moment the committee was formed, be it choosing uh, courses that were important for this thesis to come to where it is to be, or a more reliable uh, analysis that could make the thesis what it is today. So thank you so much. And uh, furthermore, I'm super grateful to my lab family, uh, the Denver lab family, uh, all the members throughout the years that have been part of this lab, uh, even before when I was here, the Denver lab back then when I joined in 2019, all the members, uh, uh, especially uh, 
Dr. Surushna Vasala and Dr. Ainha, who were there when I arrived and who in, a, in whatever time they had with me managed to inspire me to be a woman in STEM. And that was really empowering. And this work would not have been possible without the undergraduates before me that were instrumental to this thesis, their support with the sample collection, with the chloroplast DNA sequencing uh, is what has made it today. And a special thanks goes to Treat and Hannah, who are not, who can be careful, uh, who also helped with the mitochondrial DNA sequencing. And uh, when talking about sample collection, the samples were collected from diverse range of locations globally, and it required very important uh, spinning of where these samples came from. And it also included travel support for Dr. Denver, where he traveled, and for the other students. And there are people who are named here, for example, Jared Hirata, Kim Star, out of all other people. I'm sorry, I'm not being able to pronounce each of these names. So I just listed it out here. So thanks to all of them and also CQLS for where all of the same sequencing happened. I know. And also OSU for the funding and the Candy's Foundation. I would like now to narrow down on the specific members of Denver Lab family that I would like to thank. <clears throat> Beginning with Dana, who is the backbone of our lab and who with her sheer presence, be it and just existing <laughs> in the lab and her work and just everything there. <laughs> Thank you for your mentorship throughout the last year, a few years. I don't think I would have been able to get any of the sequencing done <laughs> without you and the level of feedback that you have provided in this thesis writing is just something that I will always have within myself. And I think Dina is a superwoman. <laughs> That's her ability. And the lab members that just recently joined us this fall, Jasley and Brenna, these two are one of the most wonderful human beings. And in such a short period of time, they have managed to empower me through and through and are just gonna be such terrific women in STEM that I really look forward to. And I don't think any amount of thank you is enough. But thank you. Uh, I'd also like to extend my thank you to my friends and family. Uh, my friends, Christina, Pallavi, Robina, Gaurav, Irina, who are here through Zoom, if they are not. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm here because they have been there throughout my undergrad life. So the social and emotional support, just thank you very much. And I come from a very big family and I just thought <laughs> I can't have them all. So uh, thank you everyone in Bao family. You are amazing. But special, special thanks to my sister Avantika because yeah, she gave me the good luck balloon too. <laughs> uh, I don't think this thesis would have been possible without her because she has always stepped up and has been taking care of the family and has been doing the role of an elder daughter in my absence and that has led me to focus on my life here in OSU Corvallis and just uh, go through with my thesis and thank you to her and of course my heartfelt thank you to my husband I am I forgot the rest of your name sorry <laughs> oh my god for the relentless support of uh, throughout my journey, especially uh, for his proficiency in everything digital, because of uh, the bio Python that I used, uh, the structure maneuvering, everything was uh, hitting a uh, roadblock and he has helped me through and through and even getting me back to code, coding and yeah, yeah. So thank you, thank you. And that was an integral part of my thesis. I think my thank you is longer than my whole slide. <laughs> so closing up on the presentation, like everything in my life, I would like to offer this thesis into the lotus feet of my guru, Sadhguru, whose tools for well-being is 
something that I shamelessly use and go down to this. Thank you. Okay, we'll open it up now for questions. Committee excluded. <laughs> All right, any questions from participants? Yeah, so I have a question about the differences in the results between the uh, mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA. Do you think is that reflective of like different rates of evolution in them, or like what do you think is underlying? You might be so far away, I can't. Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I'm interested in you sort of get those very different clusters when you use the mitochondrial DNA or the chloroplast DNA. What do you think is driving that difference? Is it like a difference in rates of evolution between the two, or like different starting points? Uh, so talking about the differences, uh, do you mean in chloroplast DNA and mitochondrial DNA? In terms of like the clusters you get, because you get sort of those four distinct, um, one of them, you get two clusters, it's sort of, yeah. Okay, so uh, from our previous studies and that were done in plant phylogeny, uh, it was, Found out if it was found out that the chloroplast DNA was a, a relatively faster evolving organism than the mitochondrial DNA. However, I had mentioned the Wang et al. paper, it kind of showed incongruence between those organelles. Uh, and that kind of we already had the chloroplast DNA, and that led us to think, okay, what about mitochondrial DNA? Is it does it reflect even in terms of within species variation compared to the between species variation that was done. And our initial, my initial hypothesis was there would be a congruence given that both chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA are, are both maternally inherited, right? And however, with uh, the cluster analysis that were done via structure, what we saw was different results. <laughs> there were four clusters for the chloroplast DNA and two only for the mitochondrial DNA. That could be attributed to the slower rate of evolution in mitochondrial DNA. However, uh, I think uh, the initial hypothesis of congruence was still bolstered, owing to SL10 being an outlier in both of these samples, sorry, both of these analyses. So in terms of that, I think it's the whole difference is owing to the just the difference in rate of evolution works. Other questions? Anyone else who wants to ask any question? <laughs> In more seconds, you might be on that <laughs> for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, I also want to say, uh, was there a question here? Question. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I got that. Hello, can you hear me? Hey, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Kate is talking, but I can't hear her. Maybe she can type a question. I'm in the chat. Okay, she says, how does Subi see Dharma in science and or the natural world? How does Subi see Dharma in science and or the natural world? <laughs> That's a very tricky question. Uh, so just, she says, how or does Sue BC Dharma in science and or the national world. I would like to first start with defining Dharma, uh, if many of us are not aware of it. Uh, so 
I don't know how Kate or anyone else uh, means dharma, but dharma is loosely translated as one's duty uh, that goes beyond uh, just duties. So something that you do and place beyond yourself. And I think dharma and science and in real life both have an intersection that is being in solidarity with the truth because as a scientist we are exploring different dimensions to understand life phenomena through the lens of being as truthful as we can or yeah. meaning being truthful to our what are the ones as scientists i don't know <laughs> i think being more uh transparent with the science that you do and also being transparent uh, in the life that you conduct on a daily basis. I don't have that answer. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone want to follow that question? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, as we conclude, I, I meant to say this at the onset, but I wanted to just let Subi get going. Um, firsts, I would like, let's reflect on first. Subi's the first graduate student to work on Modi trees out of the Denver lab. I'm um, super awesome. Um, first, um, defense here at CRB, as far as I'm aware. Um, Denver lab was also a first with Sulotion and doing the first Zoom. <laughs> so, anyway, terrific job, Subi. Thank you all for coming and supporting her. It's greatly appreciated. And um, we'll call that. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.